This conference will now be recorded. It's funded externally in the main by the Barking Riverside Limited uh, with a contribution from Transport for London. Uh, let's get on with it and give you a background to the project and some of the challenges we've faced. I mean, it is such a big project though that to go into all of the detail in the time that we've got is going to be very difficult. Um, so this will really give you a flavour. Uh, there'll be some computer animations in there and a few other bits and pieces to give you an idea of the scale of the project and where we are and what we've achieved. And uh, well, let's see how we go. That's... So, oh God, let's move that. Right. So there's a local vision in, in Barking and Dagenham. So the, the borough has a, a number of growth hubs. Hang on, is this slide two? There it is, yeah. Uh, with a number of rivaled opportunities to deliver a wide range of new jobs and housing across the borough. And they are as follows. So you've got Barking Riverside, which is what we're involved with, which is one of the largest residential developments in the UK, uh, 10,800 homes with, as the blurb says, superb River Thames frontage, uh, Barcelona on Thames, it was being called at one point by the head of Arking and Dagenham Council. Uh, Bean Park and the Ford Stamping Plant, uh, with the cessation of Ford activities in the Dagenham area, apart from engine production, that's now being developed as uh, residential accommodation, 3,200 new homes, uh, they reckon 1,000 jobs, and a new Bean Park station, which is getting underway fairly soon. And Castle Green, which again is a long term vision for the area, which is to put the A13 road underground and then build over the top of it and join up basically well, Barking Riverside and the, the lands that are separated by the A13 with, with Beckentry and the estates to the north. The future that we're looking at here for Barking Riverside, this is the development of 10,800 homes is really an extension from the Tilbury line loops down to a new station here near the shores of Thames. You can see all the residential development here. Uh, there's a school here, uh, which is open at the moment. One of the key planning constraints that Barking Riverside Limited have got is they're only allowed to build and have 4,800 odd homes occupied before there's an operational rail link in place to Barking. Uh, one of the reasons being that the, the ward in Barking that this actually is built in is one of the most uh, cut off wards in the UK. Uh, in terms of transportation, transport interconnections and that, it is really difficult to get to and from. There's three bus routes that serve it with bus frequencies every five to ten minutes and they are always full throughout the day and night. It's also one of the most deprived wards in the, the country. I think at one point it was rated the third most deprived ward in the UK in terms of you know, social connection, social mobility. So it has a huge societal benefit, this scheme. Uh, you can see that the, the Barking Riverside development will have you know, a fairly expensive waterfront area with a marina. And there is provision in the future potentially for a riverboat service there to Canary Wharf, but they reckon that the barking to Canary Wharf journey time would be about 10 minutes by river. So as I've already said, yeah, the, it's this single largest housing development opportunity, uh, 10,800 homes, 65,600 square meters of commercial, retail and community facilities. And the development can't happen without the provision of appropriate transport infrastructure. So what we're doing, Barking Riverside Extension, is a £327 million project programme for a four and a half kilometre stretch of track that will extend the existing gospel to Barking service from Barking through to Barking Riverside. Uh, the extension will deliver overground services to a new station at the, the heart of the Barking Riverside community with construction beginning in autumn of 2018 and train services commencing in May timetable change 2022. Uh, the delivery of the extension unlocks a wide range of benefits for people in the local area and beyond, including the homes, many of which are affordable, along with the new school, which is open a lot earlier than anybody expected, healthcare facilities, and the construction of a new district centre with the commercial and leisure facilities. 
Train service we'll be running will be a four car train service at 15 minute intervals to deliver a four train per hour service. And Arriva Rail London Limited will operate the services on behalf of TfL. So Arriva Rail London are our TOC uh, under a concession agreement. So the key stakeholders that we had to engage with during the development of this scheme, well, obviously Network Rail, Strategic Freight Network, Barking Riverside Limited, uh, the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham, DB Cargo, Legal and General, because Legal and General own a lot of the land over which we have to build, High Speed One, and we'll get to that in some detail later on, Lineside Neighbours, because a lot of the route that we redevelop actually is, we've got people's back gardens at the bottom of the cess uh, along everything, and uh, there's a lot of overhead line piling that needed to be done. Uh, the new schools, because you've introduced new transport infrastructure into an area, you, you need to make sure that you know, the kids at the schools are aware of the risks and that that go with it. And the train operating companies and the freight operating companies that exist in that part of the world. Quite a lot of uh, FOX, uh, the TOX is just C to C and uh, ourselves overground. So. Our build strategy. Because of the timescales that we had to get this done in, and because we've learned lessons with design and build in the past, we decided to go with a build only contract. So that's quite unusual. So, Ralph of London, that's me and my engineering team, provided assurance for a GRIP 5 design, so a detailed design. And our designers were required to produce a design that was fit for purpose instead of the normal thing you get, which is a thing called reasonable skill and care. We did that because we wanted to make sure that the level of design scrutiny undertaken by the designer in terms of checking was as good as it can be. That's not always necessarily the case with reasonable skill and care. Uh, it might be contentious for me to say it, but reasonable skill and care basically says that if all the designs that you get are pretty awful for every project that you do, then comparing one design to another shows that reasonable skill and care has been exercised because no one's done anything different. Fit for purpose means you have to fit your design to the purpose for which it is intended. In this case, four trains an hour running 19 hours of a day, 365 days a year, at line speed of 40 mile an hour, supplied by 25 kV electrification and all the other stuff that goes with it. So by and large, the uh, Morgan Sindel Volker Fitzpatrick joint venture who won the contract to do the build, still had design to do, because there's only certain things that you want to design in detail. You need to give the delivery contractor the flexibility to look at proprietary systems, to use systems that they believe are more efficient in construction that can yield them schedule savings in terms of time, um, potentially in cost as well. So that's things like secondary steel work, detailed rebar designs, proprietary systems designs, uh, temporary works, SSI data for the interlockings, because you know we you don't do that, you always do SSI data in GRIP 6. Uh, the stage they really changes, uh, stage signaling designs, and also the collaboration with uh, Network Rail Telecom's network services and uh, the FTN, FTNX and GSMR teams, because the transmission systems are on the national network are all done by those. Um, and a lot of the design on comms actually takes place in GRIP 6 or very late grip five, but it always hangs over because it's more design and implementation straight away rather than following the usual design process. And London Overground, Transport for London, we are delivering the scheme under a thing that called a scheme of delegated authority. So when we set this project up, we set up a, an agreement with Network Rail where we went through the same competency assessment process as Network Rail project engineers and project teams. So we've all got Network Rail Authority to work certificates and where necessary we have delegated authority from what used to be called the Root Asset Managers to sign detailed designs on their behalf. So we only had to take the design to Network Rail at approval in principle stage. Uh, that cuts out a lot of man marking with third party, outside party works approval. Uh, saved us a lot of time and a lot of money. So the scope of works that we're undertaking, uh, all concerns existing infrastructure east to Barking Station. So we reinstate the abandoned down goods line as a new up Riverside. Uh, there's three kilometers of new ballasted track. 
there's 13 renewed four track hour lead portals, uh, eight new five track or more spanning hour lead portals. I think the widest one was about 50 meters wide. Uh, 62 new simple overhead line structures, STCs and the like. Uh, three new overhead line neutral section structures because we had to move the neutral sections because the structures on which they were founded couldn't take the weight of the additional new neutral section that we needed to put on it. So that worked out to be 102 overhead line pile foundations. Um, in terms of permanent way, there was a new 40 mile an hour crossover from the upgrids to the up river side, a new 50 mile an hour FES 24 down to Albury to down river side that went in last weekend. Uh, we remodelled the Ripple Lane West Sidings, and we'll cover that in a bit more detail later on. That's uh, 10 renewed point ends. And then another one kilometre of associated ballasted track that required formation, remediation, or mm, modification, let's put it that way. And then all the new signalled routes with associated TPWS and AWS infrastructure. That really covered what we needed to do to get to a point where we grade separate. So where we grade separate, we've got a 300 metre long approach span founded on the ground slab. Uh, that consists of 240, 450 mil diameter, 12 metre deep piles, which I think they went a bit deeper in the end. Uh, a 50 metre long retained fill ramp, which we've since value engineered into a simply supported piled ramp. That leads to an E-type steel underbridge over the down through goods line and then 11 40 meter long steel and concrete composite bridge spans which gets us over the railway lands and we'll, we'll see this in a second then an e-type steel underbridge at choates road and then we get on to what we call the south viaduct which is a 43 number 25 meter long concrete viaduct spans all in all what we needed for the south viaducts 560 piles uh, 1.25 meter diameter to 30 to 40 meters deep uh, we needed 20 1.4 metre diameter piles to form a new box over the up Tilbury, which we'll cover in a bit. And then we needed nine piles, 1.5 metres diameter to a depth of 40 metres uh, pile between the high speed one running tunnels. And we'll get to that in a bit as well. And then the usual stuff. So the electrification, uh, 52 twin track already portals, one and a half kilometres of twin track slab track and three kilometres of new series two overhead line equipment. Uh, so that basically was the, the design that we from TFL supplied to the, the joint venture. Really already covered this. Uh, the infrastructure supports four trains an hour, Barking Riverside to Gospel Oak. It also covers off C2C's future service requirements because we had to do an awful lot of timetable modelling for service in the reaction at Barking Platform 7 and 8. Uh, so you get all of that and four trains per hour to Gospel Oak using traction power supply improvements to the area which we had to piggyback off of and modify slightly we also had to factor in beam park station because that's only half a mile away from where we grade separate so when that comes online you have to make sure that the timetable implications of beam park don't mess up barking as well and then gb2 gauge for high speed one freight in ripple lane sidings um, again we'll cover that a bit later on all of the modelling and that we did, we also looked at two trains per hour electrically hauled freight across uh, London running into Thameside in the peak hours as well to make sure that all of the infrastructure that we were modifying or building would still support that. Uh, the one thing we didn't provide was a fully upgraded 25 kV feeder station at Barking because at the time it was believed that the cables needed renewing by UKPN. They've since been, actually only a couple of months ago, signed off as being okay but our design actually is pretty good. And now we don't have M minus one at Barking Feeder Station any longer. So actually service perturbation can be more easily managed. So a quick diagram here of what the on-network alterations look like. So Barking Station is just over here to the left. So that is Barking Tilbury East Junction. It's probably easier to start where we terminate, which is Barking Station. Barking Riverside Station down here. So Barking Station down. The first piece of infrastructure we come across are some ultra high voltage power lines, Choates Road, uh, the ship and shovel sewer, as it's so wonderfully known. 
The high speed run exchange sidings, where all the freight from Europe comes into Barking, then over the up Tilbury, then over the two goods lines, then over the uh, Euro hub container port lines, uh, which were built for freight from China and places like that, that comes in via Europe. We carry on round and down underneath Rennick Road, and then the down Tilbury connects to the down riverside there, and we carry the new up riverside on, threading it between the existing down goods, which we have to realign through picking up the alignment of the old down goods all the way through to whoops, barking down here. And then we modify the way that freight uses the, the sidings here so that we've got a new connection to come from what we're calling the departure line across onto the up river side to, to get into barking. One thing that this does actually do is extends all the sidings here. And again, that get covered a bit later on. Our design philosophy was to keep it simple, stupid, because I don't do clever that often. So we decided to modularize as much as possible. So we decided very early on to standardize on six, 10 millimeter LME tubular piles for all the overhead line structures. Uh, we later expanded that to include all the signal structures to avoid the need for massive gravity side or end bearing foundations in poor ground. And the fact that once we worked out what size piles we needed, we couldn't get the piling rig to site to actually do them. So LME piles for just about everything. Uh, we adopted network power standard designs for ENU decks for bridge structures. Uh, the composite spans over the railway lands and over the land owned by legal in general, DB cargo, they are maxed out as far as you can go for those spans, the 40 meters. Uh, the concrete viaduct, again, we adopted Y8 precast concrete beams for that viaduct, uh, as was done at Reading, and I believe in another couple of viaducts as well. So again, standard elements, we know the performance characteristics, we know what they do, or we thought we knew what they did, which we'll get to later. And along the viaduct, anything that could be modularized in terms of parapet units, blisters for overhead line structures, location case bases, uh, track equipment, housing bases, uh, lubricator sites, everything that was modularized. So we just developed one design and used it many times. First issues we hit were geotechnical. And you've heard me talk about some of the pile sizes and pile depths that we've had uh, previous to this. Uh, the ground conditions in the area are extremely variable. Uh, made ground over a lot of it. A lot of the site that we're building this railway on was, well, the top few meters basically was a slurry pit from the old Barking power station. So the, the ground there isn't particularly competent. Then underneath that, we've got alluvial deposits. We've got peat to five meters depth in places. We've got a very high water table up to one meter below ground level. Uh, Initial calculations with the piles were going to have to be to a depth of 29 meters minimum, and they have to be end bearing. They are going to be CFA. We did end up pushing the limits of what you can do with CFA piling. And so we took a conscious decision there to oversize some of the piles due to the ineffective upper lengths and some of the shear forces they, they could exhibit. What you can't see particularly well here uh, is that this is a massive fault in the geology in the area, which surprised the living daylights out of us when we found it, especially as we had to pile right over the top of it. Uh, that led to an awful lot of head scratching and an awful lot of intensive pile design to make that work. So these are the British geological records. Um, we needed to verify that the fault existed, so we, we did. So we undertook a huge amount of uh, ground penetrating radar and resistivity testing to work out exactly what was happening with the densities and the material layouts down there. And what we found was a reasonable correlation to the geological records, but it was not fantastic. This gave us some certainty you know, to actually start basing our detailed pile designs on. Uh, so what we're able to do was, and here you can see the borehole logs, we're able to now start correlating what we're finding from the, the resistivity testing from the, the geological records against the actual logs of the boreholes and see whether what we believe to have there actually was there. Um, 
took a long time, but it did actually validate our original decision that we oversized the piles because we'd have to have oversized them anyway. So saved us an awful lot of rework. When we're on network, uh, formation and track bed, obviously we were compliant to TRK 4239 formation treatments. We look, well, we do actually, we've considered the use of GSLs and deep capping layers and optimizing those for the, the traffic that we have. We did use micro piling. Uh, we've micro piled under the FBS 24 turnout and we've also micro piled uh, for the ballast slab transition as well. So micro piling for those of you who never used it or aren't aware of it is a means of actually stiffening up the, the the ground using screw piles which are driven or screwed in below track level and they have the effect of basically forming almost the retention cage for the, the subgrade and underlying ground. Very good when coupled with, uh, with GSLs and with decent stiff track beds and you know, building things up with uh, uh, geocomposites. Initially, we had fairly aggressive formation treatments in the sidings. Now, bearing in mind these are Track Cat 6 sidings, uh, most of which dated to the mid 1930s. Uh, we didn't really want to spend a huge amount of money uh, doing formation treatments on something that was going to see less than a million tons of traffic per annum. So instead, we moved away from doing very deep digs of four to 500 millimeters with formation treatment and went for 200 to 250 digs with new ballast and steel sleepers on. Uh, the idea with that being that a steel sleeper's only got a mass of about 110, 120 kilograms as compared to about 450 for a G44 concrete. So it actually takes the, the dead load off of the formation and in those sort of low speed environments, and if you're aware of the requirements for using steel sleepers, they're absolutely ideal for quick and efficient building, uh, for which read cheaper than doing massive formation digs. Uh, the gauging that we did for the project, uh, gauging was as per normal using Clear Route 2 for passenger running lines uh, to an agreed vehicle library, agreed with Steve Valentine up in York. In the sidings at Ripple Lane, uh, there was only one siding cleared to GB2 gauge, GB2 being the continental gauge. So there was an agreement in place with DB Cargo that all the alterations to any siding, and that included the up goods and the departure line, would also be clear to GB2 gauge because they are currently foul. And that's mainly due to ground position light signals at the country end. because so that's a fairly easy thing to sort out. But to prove it, at the time, Clear Route didn't have GB2 as a kinematic envelope in it. So we had to undertake defined gauging as required by BSEN 5273. And I have to say that our designer Arcadis did a really good job on that. And the results have been borne out with the verification work we've done on site against some of the ground position light signals. The other thing that we, we had to do, and we'll again get onto this a bit later, is we needed to have a blockade on the Tilbury lines on the upper Tilbury for a period of six weeks in 2019 to carry out some fairly intensive piling works either side of the up Tilbury. Uh, it was either a, a blockade like that or basically a, a possession every weekend for a year to get the works complete. To make that happen, we had a quick look at what the diversionary route was like and suddenly discovered that there was restrictions through Upminster Platform 1 uh, due to fouls for various freight gauges. Basically, it was foul to W6A 7, 8, 9 and 10, which meant that diverted freight coming up from Tilbury would have to cross over, stop using the up, run wrong road on the down through platform two at Upminster and then cross back over on the other side. And the net effect of that on C to C's timetable during the week was to kill it completely in the peak hours. So we had to gauge clear platform one at Upminster uh, as part of our project so that we could change gauge capability on the at that location and give us the access that we needed. So 
it basically took one night with a tamper. But working out exactly what needed to be done was, uh, yeah, it's a difficult platform, that one. Let's just put it that way. So in terms of gauging in that, what do we end up with in, in the siding area? Well, we end up with the down tilbury there. This is at the tightest point in the sidings, the upriver side here, and then three sidings cleared for continental gauge freight. And then we've got the up tilbury sitting over here. And you can see that one of the overhead line portals that we put in, in fact, that is probably the biggest one that we had. Yep, it is. So I'll take a break for a second here and just play you a quick animation of the, the approach ramp area and what's taking place in what we call uh, the North Viaduct. So this is a, a quick animation from Tender Stage as the, the works that will be taking place. So hopefully this works. I can't speed it up, unfortunately. So what you see in here is the approach spans. That bridge that's just gone in goes in over the down through sidings and then we're into the 40 metre long composite spans that go over the railway lands. You can see the Euro hub sidings in there. And then when we get to the, the other side of the BB cargo lands. We have to come on. Start crossing some of the challenges, which we'll cover in a second. Let me just stop there for a second. So, so what you can see there in blue is the layout of the high speed one running tunnels. We'll put some detail on that in a second. We had insufficient space to get a standard sort of pile cap and pile arrangement in place between the two tunnels. We'll cover the restrictions soon. So we had to build a single row of piles there with the cap on the top and then two other pile cap groups and then a ground beam between them to distribute the loads so that you, we would not impart any load from rotation of these piles onto the high speed one tunnels. And here is what we needed to have the blockade for just to do this piling work here. There was no way that we could do that, as I said, you know, in any sort of reasonable engineering hour or weekend access, because to get the piling rig, especially into this section here between high speed one exchange and the up Tilbury, would mean we'd have to dewire the up Tilbury every weekend to get the piling rig in, to do the piling, to get the piling rig out. And given the time for piling and set up and everything else and mats, you, you, you name it, uh, we'd only get one pile done a weekend. We'd need 54 hours. Uh, sooner or later, we knew that we'd go to put the wires up at the end of one weekend, they wouldn't go back up again. Or if they did go back up, they'd come down fairly soon afterwards. Yes. Oh, the other thing we had to do was also institute traffic management for all the uh, the traffic that uses that area because the, the Tesco train that's operated by Stobart Rail uses the freight liner facility down there. So there's a, a lot of road-based container traffic that's running throughout the week and sometimes at weekends. So we had to work around that as well. So this final span here, you can see that hasn't got a deck on it yet, that gets lifted in this weekend. 
but just to give you an idea of the, the scale of these structures, each one of these side beams weighs about 130 tonnes or thereabouts. Uh, this weekend, we've got a 1,200-tonne uh, road crane sited here on a massive gridage because we've had to build a temporary structure over a series of gas mains to site the crane in the place where it can actually lift the, the beams in. So the two beams are going this weekend and the connecting cross steel work. And then we'll start building out and decking out from there on in. And that is what we call the North Viaduct. So just to show you again in a bit more detail, one of the challenges we had as I said was high speed run running tunnels and also getting over the, the up Tilbury. There's problems with the way that deck ends for slab have to be articulated. You have a very limited amount of skew that you're allowed to have with slab track. So in terms of the, the deck end being skewed underneath your track, it is not a good thing to have it at all. Um, unfortunately, to try and keep the, the support for the deck end perpendicular with the track, that meant that the, the support pier for this area would have gone straight through the middle of the up Tilbury line, which really isn't that good a thing to have. So we, in, in effect, we ended up building a very small tunnel over the up Tilbury to put the bearing plinth on the top of so that we could carry on with a pretty standard span design. So high speed bum running tunnels, uh, challenges here. So each high speed one tunnel has a three meter surrounding annulus, which is a no go zone. And approximately three meters between the annuli of each tunnel is a clear envelope for construction. You still have to get permission from high speed one. So the supporting structure we needed to erect required 10 number 1.5 metre diameter piles to the depth of 40 metres between the high speed one tunnels. So it doesn't give you much clearance either side of that 1.5 metre diameter to your uh, three metre envelope that you can fit yourself into. Uh, the piling was to be carried out under liquid support, then tonight. Uh, the piling had to be carried out whilst high speed one is in operation at line speed, which is about 120 mile an hour there as they're coming out of the tunnel or plunging into it. And no cover speed was permitted by high speed one. So survey team, which was uh, Richard Winthrop and Felix Bartle, surveyed and scanned the high speed one tunnels to locate them to an accuracy of plus or minus 20 mil. And that was incorporated into our federated BIM model. One problem we hit was nobody could really quite work out how to transform the CTR grid, CTIL grid, or the Union Rail grid, to OSGB 36 and then into London Survey Grid 2007, which in effect is Crossrail 09 grid, that's, which is our engineering grid for the project. So we ended up uh, paying University College London to undertake uh, a research study on that to actually work out how you would transform from the CTRL grid across and they did it and it works really well. Uh, the project developed a tunnel monitoring strategy which was reviewed and signed off by High Speed One after many many months of negotiation and uh, in the end we ended up using mesh together triaxial tilt sensors to monitor the tunnel and track deformation during our works with real-time reporting for intervention triggers. If I remember right I think uh, people would get an alert if the tunnel moved by one millimetre during our works. So a lot of triggers were triggered, let's put it that way. Uh, oh, I've forgotten what this is. Oh, this is just the... This is just what we did to build the uh, the pier over the, the up tilbury, but you've seen that before, so I'll, I'll spare you that again and the god awful music. Right, the other challenges that we had on the site um, Choates Road and the ultra high, volt, ultra high voltage transmission lines. So these pylons here are 400 kVA transmission lines. This is Choates Road. We need to have standard clearance for double decker buses, so your standard highways clearance on the highway, but we had to balance that off against 
getting the required electrical clearance from the, the lowest part of the ultra high voltage transmission lines to the highest part of the railway at which you could expect uh, a member of railway staff to be working. And that would be, you know, red linesman working on the catenary in a muke bucket. Those two dimensions, when you add them together and work out what you need, gave us 100 millimetres to play with in terms of what we could do. And that's what actually drove us the select slab track because the construction height of the slab track system gave us 100 millimetres in our pocket. If we'd used ballasted track across the viaduct or ballasted track at this location, uh, with the depths that we would have needed because it would have been on bridges and, and all the other bits and pieces that need to go with it, we couldn't have made the whole thing work together. We'd either have to have compromised on highway clearance or compromised on electrical clearance to the transmission lines, uh, neither of which is a good one. So we really were threading the eye of a needle through here. So the vertical profile that gave us was in effect coming up from our grade separation, rising at one in 40, into a 225 metre radius curve that comes around, starts to straighten out, then diving down, but we can't dive down too much because we've got to get over Choates Road and give highway clearance. And then we've got to dive down steeply even more after that to get underneath the, the ultra high voltage transmission lines with the required clearance, 13.6 metres, I believe. So when you combine all of that together, uh, we've engineered a, a pretty cool little roller coaster in this part of the world. So the viaduct, uh, it's one and a half kilometres of concrete steel viaduct and composite bridge spans. Uh, it's one and a half kilometres of twin slab track, 52 OLED portals and Barking Riverside Station. Uh, the articulation is a fixed free arrangement. So even though they're 25 metre spans, it's actually a 50 metre long bridge deck. So it's fixed in the middle, sorry, oh, wrong way around. <laughs> Fixed in the middle, three at that end, three at that end, giving you a 50 metre span. And it's important to consider the articulation of your joints and, and which ends are free and which, which ends are fixed so that you can understand how the thing's going to move thermally once you finish building it. Uh, the construction is fairly simple, as I've said before. Uh, so we've got piles, piles cap, piers, Y8 beams, decks, intermediate slab, derailment curb, modular parapets and blisters, and the slab track system on top of that. So the ramp and viaduct track form that we adopted, you know, we actually start to talk about permanent way. Now, as I said, we already had a one in 40 gradient uh, cresting to a 225 metre radius curve. Because this is adjacent to a residential uh, Settlement. The only thing you, you could do is put CWR in, but of course the limiting radius for CWR is 350 metre radius for ballasted track, uh, not for slab track. We have the steep gradient to get over high speed one exchange sidings and diving down over Choates Road and under the UHV transmission lines, as I've said. Basically what that ends up doing is if it was to be ballasted and if it could be ballasted, you're going to get sleepers driving. You're not going to be able to, to stress it. Uh, so you're going to have to put joints in, joints are going to wear, joints are going to create noise. Noise is going to annoy the neighbors. Um, yeah, it, it's not good for anybody. So that's one of the main reasons we ended up choosing slab track. But even though we've chosen slab track, we needed to understand how the slab track system was going to perform. So initially we started out using the old was it PAN 67 guidance for modeling of loads over gradients, uh, trying to use MT19 curves to determine exactly what's going to happen. Uh, yeah, MT19 is still a mystery to most people. So we ended up using Dynamis to model the, the passage of various loads over the uh, the viaduct, which ended up just being passenger traffic and a class 66 hauling a long welded rail train. And that was fine for journey time analysis and seeing whether the traction actually had the ability to get up there and over and around. But we needed to understand what was going to happen in service. So we commissioned the IR at Huddersfield to undertake 
some detailed performance modeling of the track system. So really we wanted to understand our T gamma forces and T gamma, as you know, is basically what's going to inform you as to your the wear index that you're going to get for your rail and also to the propensity for RCF to, to be generated. So our line speed was 40 mile an hour. Uh, we modeled with a 10 mile an hour over speed and under speed. We modeled because it was 225 meter radius with and without check rails. We modeled it with and without gauge widening. We modeled it in tear and crush states. And then we modeled it using a theoretically overly torsionally stiff primary suspension to produce higher angles of attack or a plastic pig as they're known. So a lot of analysis, and what did it tell us? Well, first off, we uh, were interested in the Y over Q effects that it had. So basically the propensity for wheel lift and the propensity for flange climb and derailment. Interesting results, and it basically told us there really wasn't any difference between the checked and the unchecked state. Um, bearing in mind SIN 99 now says, I believe that we are to consider check rails below 250 meter radius. Uh, that was one of the reasons we did this, but the, the results were really interesting. So first off, we were able to say, we don't need a check rail. That's great. Don't need a check rail, track system becomes a darn sight simpler to, to design and build. We did, however, keep derailment curbs just in case. T gamma. Uh, T gamma forces, again, it was really quite interesting, very consistent and nothing in there that would cause us any significant concern. We were very lucky in the, the, the type of bogey that's going to be running there in, in normal services, the, the EcoFlex 4. So we knew the performance characteristics of the EcoFlex 4 bogey uh, because it's been used on the class 345s, which is the, the cross rail trains. You know, those nice little light up colored things that are running on Great Eastern Main Line. So good models exist of that, and there's some good in-service data of that as well. So that was used by Huddersfield in Vampire. We saw that, yeah, if we put a check rail in, we would reduce the, the T-gamma forces on the high rail. You would expect that because uh, as you make back a flange contact with the, the check rail, your T-gamma on the high rail goes down. It does put some uh, additional force into the low rail, uh, not as much as you would expect. And removing the, the check rail obviously increases the, the contact patch forces on the low rail. From that, we were able to determine that we're an actual fact. We Not having the check rail was a good thing. We were not going to generate rolling contact fatigue. We didn't believe that we had any significant issue with accelerated rail wear. And we ended up going with the uh, grey 300 rail steel MHT. Which is what I've just said. Okay. So our recommendations for a cross laden vehicle, uh, the Y over Q was found to be 0.37 relative to a limit value of one. So yeah, it's 0.8 millimeter of wheel lift relative to a limit value of six millimeters very very low uh class 345 in tear and modified tear with a higher plan view stiffness resulted only in a marginal increase in the maximum recorded y over q to 0.42 so even putting an inherently stiff god awful vehicle around there didn't have a massive effect so again so we, we didn't choose a check route and we didn't believe that we need to provide really 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 robust flange uh, sorry, uh, derailment containment. We've kept robust curbs in, but we didn't put one down the six foot, basically, which saved a bit of money. Said so, uh, regards to gauge widening, there was no significant net benefit found. Um, cant efficiency, again, the applied cant at 100 millimeters was found to be fine, so we, we ran with that. Uh, that last note there, it says it noted number of the applied count levels and speed study resulted in the excessive count efficiencies yeah when you're running at over speed 10 mile an hour uh, yeah you were getting excessive count efficiencies but you shouldn't be designing track for over speed running and certainly would not be an enhanced permissible speed route so the fired up track form what did we end up with 
we needed the slimmest slab track system we could find because of this clearance problem with the ultra high voltage transmission lines. So we ended up using the OBB poor STA slab form, as it was then called. It's now just called STA, Slab Track Austria. It's a good system. It's been used a number of times on network rail before. There's a bit on Gospel Oak parking. Uh, there's a bit in Queen Street Tunnel in Glasgow. And I did the, I started doing product approval for it back in 2011 for the use in Branson and Washington Tunnel in Lincolnshire. Very simple concept, self-supporting slabs in terms of their reinforcement, uh, seven or eight rail seat positions per slab, 5.2 meters long, and a big hole for a shear key in two places. One of the net benefits of, of the system, and I'm probably going to be covering this in slides and I've completely forgotten, I've written it down, is that setting it up and lining and leveling it is pretty damn simple. When you've got a conventional system like Raider 2000, every rail seat assembly needs to be lined and leveled to get it to within the required tolerances. So when you think you've got three axes in which that can actually move, your X, Y and your Z, every one of those rail seats has to be analysed and set. Whereas with these slabs, the geometry is actually already cast into the slab. So all you need to do is basically align the four corners in the X, Y, and Z planes, which vastly reduces the amount of time it takes to set up your track and, and get your geometry correct. Don't get me wrong though, I mean, moving a, a slab that weighs the best part of five tons is uh, a lot more difficult than shifting uh, a couple of base plates around or, or uh, a duo block sleeper with a hedgehog assembly sticking out the side of it. But you do get consistency of manufacture, which is good. Uh, the rail fastening system, is the Voslo W300, which is also in use on Raider 2000. So that's a well-known and understood system. Uh, what we have here is an example of the system. Okay, that's 1060. That's installed on line eight, the uh, VDI eight in Germany, which we went out to, uh, to do a fact finding visit on. It wasn't for the beer honest. And what you can see on the right there are what are called uh, BSP base plates, and we'll cover those off in a bit more detail in a minute. Those BSP base plates are there to control a particular phenomenon, uh, which we do have at Barking, which is to do with deck end rotation and the effect that that has on axial rail stress. So when you get a free end of a bridge deck, uh, as a train approaches it, the bridge deck can deflect upwards and you could have a train coming from the opposite direction causing that bridge deck to deflect upwards and also induce a twist in the bridge. The limit of deflection is very small, two milliradians is what the maximum limits are that are permitted, um, especially when you're using slab track. Why it's an issue is because you've got a huge number of forces that you need to consider at your deck joint positions and that you need to manage. <clears throat> so the interaction between the track structure and a bridge structure, the consequences of the behavior of those structures on the other, occurs because there's a physical connection between them, whether the rails are directly fixed or there's a ballast bed in between the track and the bridge. So the interaction results in forces being applied to the track, rails, fastings and ballast, and the bridge substructure, blah, blah, blah. And these forces are in addition to those which would be expected if the track and the bridge were analysed separately. I, this is a, when you put the system together, you can end up with problems. So one of the big problems here is that Eurocode 1, which is the standard that's used to design the structure, EN 1991, in particular part 5, uh, defines the requirements for design of structures and traffic loads. But the Eurocode addresses the basic requirements for structural performance for specific load cases. It doesn't really address the impacts of those performance requirements and load cases on the track system itself. And when we're talking track system here, we're talking about the rail, the rail fastener, and the rail fastening system. Um, there's a lot to get your head around when you get into this. 
and I've put one too many numbers in that one. So when you start digging into stuff, the euro norm for for slab systems and the euro norm for ballastist track systems. Uh, so one of them, EN 13.4815, that's the performance requirements for track fastenings for slab systems. And then EN, rats, that's the wrong number, 13642, not three, um, ballastist track systems doesn't fully account for the performance of the fastening system. In effect, we've got a bit of a mess here. And that leads to structural designs frequently leaving the track system specifier with a complex issue to resolve. This was the case at Barking. So basically what happened at Barking was if we were to use the load model 71 specified in EN 1991, uh, we overstressed the rail and we overstressed the rail fastenings to a point whereby they go beyond their fatigue limit and we had a, a significant risk present of broken fastenings in service and also potentially broken rails. Why do we have that? Well, because the base parameters in Euro code one really don't apply to Barking Riverside. So we've got a Euro code one, load model 71, 25 and a half tonne axle load, 200 kilometers per hour speed, a minimum radius of 1500 meters, send 60 rail, <laughs> load model uh, 71, as it's basically known, and then load model SW0 and an alpha factor, which is a fudge factor of 0 to 1.5 which basically means take your peak forces, multiply them by 1.5, and that's what you've got to cope with. And the Barking design started in 2016 before a significant piece of SEN research and recommendations that flipped back to the Eurocode was published. So if anybody can get hold of a copy of SEN TR17231, I'd recommend you do and have a read. It's an eye opener, it really is. I could wax lyrical about that one for ages. Uh, So that gave us a problem at Barking Riverside. We had a problem with deck end rotation being in excess of the two millirad limit specified in the EN. Uh, so on slab systems, that gives us a problem. The mitigating factor becomes the fatigue stress limit of the rail fastening and the stress capacity of the rail. We adopted a Deutsches Bahn design for a very resilient plate and clip, uh, which arrangement for the first three rail seats abutting a free deck end, the USP plates. Uh, that then left us with the problem with the stress capacity of the rail to solve. So these are the BSP plates, and you saw them in the previous picture. Uh, very resilient laterally, but they don't deflect laterally, and very resilient in the vertical load as well. So this actually gives us the capacity now to go from your normal 12 and a half kilonewton, or therefore fatigue loading on a clip up to 30 kilonewtons of fatigue loading on the clip. So we're not going to overstress the SKLs. So that sorted out vertical forces. Lateral forces, in particular the axial rail stresses, i.e. the stresses induced by curving, completely different. Um, this is where it gets really complicated. So we have to consider the thermal forces of the rail. So that's going to be your background stress that you've induced by stressing it. That's going to be the thermal effects of the rail, i.e. what the ambient temperature is, so how much tension or compression is in it due to the temperature that's around at the day. You've got to think about what's the, uh, the neutral temperature of your bridge structure, because a big lump of concrete acts a little bit like a storage radiator, so it will have a temperature that can affect the, uh, the stresses in the rail. And then you've got the stresses induced in the rail by curvature. And then the stresses are induced in the rail by curvature being affected by the traffic loads on the rail as well. And all of those add up to a stress sum that basically tells you what we call the axial rail stress of a rail is. Now, normally we will take the limit, and this is being challenged at the moment, fact, axial rail stress as being about uh, 112 megapascals. And if you're above 112 megapascals, you've got a potential fatigue problem. With your rail. So these are all the sorts of things that we, we look at. We look at your static wheel force limits, your maximum permissible forces, and we use those to define what your <clears throat> vehicle forces are. 
This is all uh, in GMRT 2141, but that's actually under revision at the moment. We knew that our vehicle forces were, were okay, so we ran the calculations. We knew what the liable, so the allowable natural force was in terms of kilonewtons. We knew what our calculated kilonewton force was. That was good. So we knew that we had a 13.97 kilonewton lateral force being applied at the rail. We used that uh, along with a, a load factor figure that was derived from the, the Y over Q values that we'd actually undertaken by a proper modeling using Vampire rather than the, the 1.5 that state in load model 71 and worked out what the, the stress component was within the rail uh, for vertical bending, lateral bending, torsional, curvature effects, residual effects, thermal effects, what the permissible stress is, either stress capacity of the rail, and then what the reserve stress was. And what we found out was that at the outer edge of the rail foot, the reserve stress was just above the 112 megapascals proposed limit. Uh, we actually believe that our reserve stress is far better than that and that we don't have a problem. And Network Rail understand that as well. And we're jointly working with Network Rail and hopefully Railway Safety Standards Board when I go to them next week uh, to fit monitors on the, the rail to monitor strain in service and deck end rotations and all the bits and pieces to go with that to see how well the, the theory matches the reality because this has never been done before. No one's ever done this. It's a huge gap in knowledge in the rail industry as to what happens to the rail stresses on tightly curved track and especially where you've got deck end rotations. Um, yeah, um, I can't take much more than that because I've still got to write the, the paper begging the 70,000 quid from RSSB. I've got to hope they're not on the call. Um, we'll move on. We're almost done. Uh, the switch and crossing track form, uh, again, modular, modular concrete slabs, uh, manufactured by Port again. Very quite, very simple, he says, until you see the next drawing. Um, don't pay too much attention to the fact that the, the clip colours look a lot like this year's McLaren livery. That wasn't intentional, honest. That's... But the, the system is the, the Schwehag DFF system. Um, it's quite cute. So what we have here is a, a modular interlocked polyethylene base plate, and that gets clipped together. It's like Lego with a wrap, with a a conformance pad under there, then we've got a base plate pad, then a base plate, then a rail pad, SKL clips, and this gets grouted into a pocket in top of the slab. We took a different approach to resilience in the SNC. We designed the SNC to have a consistent deflection uh, rather than letting a static stiffness, 25 kilonewtons, actually guide us as to what we needed to do. Uh, that counteracted the problem that you get with rolled or excessive deflection in the large footprint plates, especially when you get to the overcast crossings and we've got a CVS 10 scissors there. Uh, so we defined a permissible range for stiffness of 25 kilonewtons to 40 kilonewtons. And the modelling that we've done on the track system shows that we get a consistent 1 to 1.5 deflection across all of the SNC under load and we don't get any gross changes of deflection when we're going between massively different footprint size plates. So that's all been through testing and product approval with Network Rail and will be going in soon. Well, he uh, says soon, August. Uh, the point operating equipment that we've chosen, we've chosen to use Versed Alpine Unistar, the electrohydraulic variant. We've chosen it because it's cost effective. Uh, this is different I mentioned Anna Cornish later on, and I saw she's on the call. Um, it builds on the work that Anna Cornish did at LU with the HREM variant. It's a good machine. Uh, the way where we're using it on network rail, it drives like a clamp block. It's wired like a HW. It uses uh, standard HW solid state interlocking interfaces and emulation circuitry. 
it's tradable up to 40 kilometers an hour with no damage to the switches. We don't need stretcher bars. Uh, the variant that we have on a CVS switch drives, locks and detects at the toe and the heel. Uh, that improves safety for a CVS switch because you normally only put a BR998 relay, uh, sorry, supplementary detector on and larger switches. So what we now actually have is obst obstacle detection, obstruction detection in the switch where you would not normally have it. Uh, it's still four rated. We reckon we've got a failure rate of one in 50 years or a service life of one in 50 years. And it solves a multitude of problems that we have with point operating equipment on slab, uh, either being too resilient or not resilient enough, and that then causing reliability problems. And yeah, we'd never have gone down that road if uh, if Anna Cornish had never pointed us in that direction. Where we are with it, the final safety case work is underway now. Um, we expect full product approval for trial from Network Rail in May 2021. Uh, the installation first planned at Barking for slab track, and then the next installation, which will probably take place now before Barking, is at Uddingston in Scotland on the West Coast Main Line. That will be an NR60 Mark II 1 in 28 switch diamond, uh, 100 mile an hour turnout. It's uh, a H double junction. And if you've not seen it before, that's what it looks like. You can so this is a drive lock detect unit. You can have four in series and one power pack. It's a presentation in its own right. Um, this is the, the configuration we've got at parking. So we've got tower switch, heel of switch, drive lock detect units, four of them. As it's a slab system, we have derailment containment curbs. So this is how you would operate things in an emergency. So we've actually got a derailment curb through here and you can have your local ops manager steward in place of safety operating the uh, hydraulic power pack on a wall. Ergonomically, it's brilliant. Uh, so what will this all look like when we get to the end of it very quickly? So this is a fly through. This is taken from the, the federated model for the, the viaduct. which we also use for signal sighting. Uh, this is a very coarse model. We've since got a far better rendered one that we'll be using for dri driver route learning. And the one thing we did model was the Barking Riverside development as well, so that we could model uh, sunlight and glare from the windows to see if that was going to cause a problem for drivers. And welcome to Barking Riverside. That's what the station looked like from the outside. Uh, you'll see that again in a minute. Um, pretty standard cross section for a station. Uh, it is all elevated. One of the reasons it is elevated is there are going to be roads beneath the, the viaducts and well you can't get the station back down the ground level in time. <clears throat> Uh, so that's Barking Riverside. What it does do, though, is unlock other future projects. So very quickly, there's a, a station called Castle Green that's 
potentially plan for the future. So before we, as, well, at the very start, I said about underground in the A13 west of Lodge Avenue. Uh, so our, the extension that we're building also includes the potential for a new station at Thames East, but we now know it's going to be called Castle Green. And that would service uh, a radius of about 900 metres around it that would take in that whole new developments going in there and quite a bit of the existing uh, area that falls just outside the catchment area for the new Riverside station. So this is the area here that's down for rezoning as a housing and accommodation with the A13 now running underground rather than above ground. Roughly speaking, that's what the station would look like. But the important thing was when we did our design, when we built our railway, it looks blooming odd because you've got a huge wide way between the down and the up river side. But that is because we've made spatial provision for the station in the future. We've made sure there's nothing in here that could stop piles going in. The drainage has been rooted so that it does not run underneath where the platform would be. The overhead line has already been designed so that there's no live, live parts over where the future platform edge would be. Uh, so really, it would be quite simple to build this. Potentially, you could build a lot of it behind a Vortok fence in traffic hours if you wanted to. That's so that's just the regurgitation of what I've just said. Uh, other follow on projects, and this is going to start in 2022, ironically, just after we finished. There you go. Uh, Ripple Lane Nodal Yard. Uh, so as we were designing this, we were talking to Guy Bates at Strategic Freight Network, and there's plans for Ripple Lane sidings to become what's called a nodal yard. Now, currently, the sidings in Ripple Lane Yard are too short for most consists that run on the Tilby Line loop, so they're hardly used. Or if they are used, they have to split trains and stay with them on two sidings. Uh, when Crossrail comes on stream, uh, Forest Gate Junction uh, becomes virtually unusable for freight to wind its way across towards Stratford and the North London line. So the Gospel Oak Barking Line becomes the primary freight route at that point. But the Gospel Oak Barking Line is just about at capacity for passenger paths and freight paths. So if you can increase the length of your freight trains, you can double the, the capacity for freight because a path is a path. doesn't matter whether it's 400 metres long or 775 metres long. So the, the plan really is for the future for Ripple Lane is to stack and flight freights in the shoulder peaks. So you need somewhere to hold your trains. So basically what we now have is the ability to stack five 775 metre long freights. Okay, one siding is about 690, but anyway, uh, in Ripple Lane as a result of this scheme and then flight them across London one after the other to get to West Coast Main Line and get off out. So me and my team did the approval and principal design for this, uh, which has now been handed over to Network Rail for them to deliver it. And it's a nice job by Simon Cutler, that one. And that's what it will look like. So this is what we've built for Barking Riverside. This is how it gets modified. So all the expensive bits that we do for Riverside, like the switch on crossings, don't have to be touched again. It's just the plain line elements. That's a really interesting piece of s &C, but we don't have time for that today. So that's the, the end of it. I'd like to say thank you to some of the guys that were involved in this, uh, getting us to this particular stage and also in the build as well. So Xavier and Sarah Shabbat and my team, Adam Smith, Felix Bartle, Richard Winthrop, Guy Bates, Menar, Paul Wierty, Martin Kerno, who was a big help with uh, the early days of this project. Nigel Wilson and Brian Whitney. Without Brian, we couldn't have resolved the, the rail stress issue. Um, Brian's been invaluable to, yeah, basically agreeing that the approach we're taking was correct on that. And the construction engineering manager at, at the joint venture, Neil Hamilton, and uh, some other people, Will Slats, Jan van Rensburg, Will Loveridge, all the Volker Rail, and the designers as well, which is Paul, Paul Mountford and Nick Arms. Uh, I'll say questions if I can find where this is. I can show you where we are today, and you can get hopefully an idea of. Uh, 
This was taken in October. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dave. It's very interesting. Uh, are you happy to take questions over the video or do you want the video to run first and then take questions? <laughs> 